Hello again, witches, seekers, and friends, and welcome to the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast, the show where we do a little ranting, raving, and wand waving. I'm your host, Paige, and together we're going to explore magic and spirituality, social justice, psychic realm, and most importantly, the tarot. Hello, witches, and thank you for tuning in today. I'm very excited for today's topic, tarot cards. (laughs) I'm a huge fan of tarot cards and the art of using them both to divine messages from spiritual sources and as a way to explore ourselves. Today, we're going to talk about a few things we know about the origins of tarot, the things we don't really know, and the legends that are born from this mystery. So when I first advertised this episode, I had hoped to finish reading and then, of course, review both Queering the Tarot and Tarot for Troubled Times. But the universe had other plans, and it's because I'm working on something really, really big that I cannot wait to tell you guys about, except that I have to wait to tell you guys about it. So, you know, (laughs) I'll make it up to you later. Uh, I will be saving these books for a later episode. I'm sure this is not the last time I'm ever going to talk about the tarot on this show. So today, I'll still be talking about Madame Pamita's Magical Tarot, which I gave five crystal balls out of five. And I'm also going to be talking a little bit about Fortune Telling with Playing Cards by Jonathan D. So hopefully today's episode still answers a lot of your questions about tarot and how to use them and where they came from. One of the most incredible powers attributed to witches, uh, even Halloween witches, is the power to see into the future. Some do this through prophecies foretold by powerful psychics or some sort of disgusting brew. And (laughs) And some do this by using tools aligned with divine powers, things like crystal balls and runes and tarot cards. No hate to the runes and the crystal balls, but tarot cards are my absolute favorite. And actually, I only found out that people read crystal balls like four years ago, and I have not stopped being excited about it since. So (laughs) seriously, no hate to crystal balls. So I love the tarot because there's just something about these cards that elicits a really strong response in people. The artwork and the symbolism speaks volumes before the reader even has to open their mouth. Even people who don't know anything about the tarot can recognize some of the cards and can feel some sort of way about them. And that's what made sure that that tarot cards and this art has stood the test of time. So before tarot cards were used to divine the future, they were playing cards. (laughs) Uh, Most Many playing cards, a lot of playing card decks throughout Europe, Italy especially, still resemble resemble tarot cards in the Marseille style, but are used to play actual games, usually called Tarachi or Terracini. Though many Italians do use them for divination now, um, Mary Grace Faroon in Italian folk magic talked about using the Sicilian playing cards as a method of divination. And you can find those on Amazon or any sort of online retailer. But if you have any sort of Italian shop in your city, they should have some Sicilian playing cards there that you can take home. They're really neat, really cool artwork. um, And just totally different than a lot of the things you're going to find at witchy shops. So the cards themselves (laughs) made it to Europe in the 14th century. But using the playing cards, especially tarot decks for divination, didn't really start until the 1700s as far as we know. So the popularity of using tarot decks and other playing cards as a form of cardomancy or divination... um, Priests and preachers really didn't like that, right? You know, they rallied against it. The cards are agents of the devil. And, you know, they told everybody that the cards had scary mystical powers, which naturally made the cards incredibly popular. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Unintended consequences for you. Bonus for everyone else. 
And it wasn't really, it wasn't just really the priests rallying against the devil that drove our mysterious fascination with the tarot. In the 1780s, a theory that the cards are actually Egyptian in origin, and that they are actually the book of ancient Egyptian god Thought, was published in an essay by Antoine Coul de Gabelin, a Protestant pastor, Freemason, and a lover of occult mythology. Now, before I continue, I'm going gonna, <laughs> gonna to remind you guys that even though I am Canadian, um, my French is awful. My French accent is awful. It's just no good. And I'm going to have to say even more French names, and I'm sure it's just going to get worse and worse. <laughs> so if you are a native French speaker, and it sounds like I'm butchering your language, I am, and I'm a disgraced languages everywhere. It's not just yours. And I apologize. I will try to put a lot of these names in the description so that you can read them instead of, you know, banking on my awful pronunciation. So Antoine <laughs> was a Protestant pastor, Freemason, and occultist. And he was a writer. And King Louis XVI of France was on his subscriber list. So this theory that the cards were inspired by ancient Egyptian mythology was spread pretty wide and mostly just kind of accepted as fact. He's also responsible for some of the cards being aligned with Christian values like temperance and justice and strength. Two years later, in 1783, a different French occultist and a card reader named Jean-Baptiste Alliette, also known as Atea, published the first guide to the signs and the symbols of the cards and how to read them. He also agreed about the Egyptian origins of the cards. And this is how the tarot, the tarot deck in one of the forms we kind of recognize now was officially born. He expanded on the Egyptian origins and on its connection to thought and assigned the suits to elements. So wands are fire, cups are water, swords are air, and the coins or pentacles, depending on your deck, are earth. He firmly established the major and the minor arcana and them being slightly different. He published his own deck eventually that was the first one to be consciously inspired by ancient Egyptian principles. And he even created a society for the reading and the practice of tarot divination. He did this for the rest of his life. The rest of his life was all tarot all the time. So when he was asked where he actually learned about reading the tarot in this manner, all he said was that he had learned it from an Italian who had given him the deck. Uh -huh. <laughs> so tarot cards do have an Italian origin, but it's not their only origin. Actually, France is big, 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 a big part of our tarot history. But let's let's jump back to ancient Egypt for just a second. We talked a little bit about the Egyptian god Thoth uh, last week because he is the husband of Mayet, the goddess of justice and truth. So Thoth was the god of writing, magic, wisdom, and the moon. In the Featherheart ceremony after death, he was the scribe that was recording everything for the official record of the universe. Thoth was a super popular god, and he was actually worshipped in Egypt for over 5,000 years, which is the longest any god from any religion has ever been worshipped. So this book of his that is supposedly the entire basis of the tarot, because he was this god of knowledge and wisdom and writing, was said to hold all of the knowledge of life and death, the full spectrum of wisdom of the gods. And it had immense power. A lot of secret societies who really latched on to the ancient Egyptian mythology, one of their, like the core tenet of a lot of their fraternal societies, um, was the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom. And a lot of times it was occult knowledge, but knowledge in general, which is something I, I kind of respect about it. I like to, you know, picture it as a bunch of cute, like nerdy guys in a library. I know that's not it, but well, I like it. Uh, anyways, a lot of different books and scrolls were said to be the book of thought, right? But the only, only real place it's been found, this book, 
is in a fictional morality tale. Ah, you guys know I love this. So I'm pretty pumped. <laughs> so this is the abridged version, of course. So in this story, a man named Neferkapta tries to steal the book from the god Thought. It's being hidden at the bottom of the Nile in a box that's surrounded by serpents. So Neferkapta fights the serpents and he steals the book. And before he can even return home, the gods kill his wife and his son as punishment for stealing. Neferkapta kills himself and demands to be entombed with the book so that no one else can make the same mistake. <sighs> but of course, someone else is going to make the same mistake because generations later, Setna comes along to steal the book and he encounters Neferkapta's ghost, of course, who tries to warn him that the book is cursed and that it will ruin his life. But Setna doesn't listen. He busts in and he steals it from the tomb. Shortly he, after he leaves, before he can get home, he meets a beautiful woman who seduces him and actually convinces him to murder his entire family and then humiliate himself in front of the pharaoh. And he goes through all of this horror to learn, fortunately, that this was a vision or a dream from Neferkapta. He was trying to warn Setna about the book. And it worked. He returned the book this time. And he even did Neferkapta a favor, finds the bodies of his family, and buries them all together so that they can be reunited. The moral of the story is that the knowledge of the gods is not for man to know. Which, of course makes everybody want to read it even more. <laughs> that and, um, you know, scary Egyptian tomb-based curses were really, really all the rage during the Age of Tarot. So, super fun, right? There's no definitive proof that thought has anything to do with the tarot, but there's also no proof that he did not. That doesn't make this not a part of tarot or something fake because ancient Egyptian mythology and culture is never going to stop appealing to the rest of us. They left behind so many records and yet so much is still a mystery. And that's always going to inspire, you know, mystery and theory and discoveries just forever. So that's a little bit about how Egypt came to be I'm kind of roped in. <laughs> so getting back to France, a decade or so after Etea released his guide on the tarot, Mademoiselle Lenormand become, he became the card reader to the rich and famous, or so she says. <laughs> uh, apparently, according to her, she read cards for Napoleon and Empress Josephine. Those were her, you know, her main clients and really did become the card reader to the rich and famous after that. People loved a good rumor, right? She used a combination of the Marseille tarot deck that was once used for the Tarachi games and a deck of playing cards. She used them in tandem. She became incredibly popular. She's still one of the most famous uh, card readers ever to have lived. And after her death, a particular style of deck was released under her name that has its, all its own symbols and numbers and um method. And we're going to talk a little bit more about some of these different tarot like groups real soon, <laughs> in case you feel confused. So for those unaware, at this point in history, what is considered the classic tarot, the Rider Waite, has not been invented yet. <laughs> but that is about to change. We're in 1850, well, a little into the 1850s, actually, and Eliphas Levy agrees that the tarot has Egyptian origin, but disagrees with some of the symbolism created by Etea and argues that the tarot is obviously, obviously, tied to Hermetic Kabbalah and the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. I never knew how this happened. So, <laughs> so I, I had to do a little bit of research here. Uh, Hermetic Kabbalah and Jewish Kabbalah are not the same thing. While both of them have this element of mysticism, Hermetic Kabbalah really is enmeshed with the this European notion of the occult. Uh, the occult, Freemasonry, secret societies, uh, ceremonial magic. 
Temple of the Golden Dawn and all of that. That is Hermetic Kabbalah. It has a lot of Jewish elements into it, like the um, the Hebrew alphabet and the 22 letters. But it also includes things like Egyptian mythology and that's ceremonial magic and Greek mythology and lots of ancient Greek and practices like divination using the tarot. It was based on the writing of a figure known as Hermes Trimagestus, who was believed to be both Hermes from ancient Greece and thought from Egypt. So Eliphas Levy, his writings about Hermetic Kabbalah really are the basis for what became all of the occult movements that sprang up after this point. He is the, the, the originator of the image of Baphomet, you know, the, the goat god that um, became very popular, very much associated with Satanism and the temple of um, the temple of Satan. So in 1896, Levy's book, which had been known as Dogma and the Ritual of High Magic, was translated into English by an American who spent most of his life living in London, Arthur Edward Waite, who would go on to commission from his fellow <laughs> Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn member, Pamela Coleman Smith, to create a tarot deck based on Hermeticism and on the works of Levy. Pamela, Pamela Coleman Smith also drew inspiration from what's known as the Sola Busca deck, which is the oldest known copy of a deck of 78 tarot cards. It was actually engraved on metal plates by an unknown artist in northern Italy in like 1491. The plates and the, the, the paintings that resulted from them are in museums, of course. <laughs> so she drew inspiration from that as well as, uh, you know, her beliefs about Hermeticism, images from the Marseille Tarot, and meditative visions that she had herself of what the true meaning of the cards was and how she can present that to other people. The Rider Waite, that's what this came to be known, uh, named after the company who produced it, which was Rider, and Waite, who was the guy who commissioned it. You know, no mention of... <laughs> No mention of the artist for quite some time, though now we are much better at including her in the story. Um, it's still considered the definitive deck by many people. It's my definitive tarot deck. Uh, so it was released in 1909. And it was the first time that the minor arcana was loaded with symbolism and had just as much symbolism in each individual card as the major arcana. Coleman Smith was really t talented, right? She was talented and she was gifted. And I think she was a little bit psychic there, but she was not paid nearly enough. <laughs> you can find a lot of really cool um, documentary shows and articles and books about Pamela Coleman Smith now. And she was a very interesting person and very, very talented uh, artist. So in that very abridged version of our early tarot history, we've already touched on some of the like specific tarot, I call them tarot families or tarot groups. So first we have the Marseille deck, which has 56 cards and is designed for playing the card game, Tarot Tarachi. The Marseille deck has a white background, bold woodcut prints, and then again, really bold blocks of primary colors. It's a pretty nice deck, but it's, it's much different from the deck that's considered standard, which is the Rider Waite. This deck has 78 cards, which again has become standard for most tarot decks. And much of the symbolism from the Marseille deck is used in the Minor Arcana. A lot of the characters are the same. But this was the first deck to include full designs on each of the cards that are considered the Minor Arcana. So this has become the standard for other tarot decks that are released based on its symbolism. They also highlight different meanings on each one of the minor cards, which I think makes tarot cards much more interesting 
there's so much to see on some of those cards. So even though they're called minor, there is still a lot to get out of them because of the symbolism included on them. Lenormand decks differ in a lot of, a lot of ways. So these decks have 36 cards. They don't have the four suits. They, the cards don't get read and reversed or flipped. And they don't have quite as much focus on psychological or spiritual matters. They're much more practical. Tarot cards, when you're reading them, it, it really relies on you using your intuition. But Lenormand cards are read in a linear pattern with very like clear context based on their position and their relationship to the other cards. These cards also feature playing card symbols most of the time, as well as their main symbol, which is things like the moon, the key, the coffin, the anchor. These are very interesting. Um, this is not one that I've gotten the hang of using quite yet. It's, it's difficult for me, but you can get really, really incredible and interesting Lenormand decks. And I really love the, the kind of clear symbols, right? One that I do have, and it's, it's, it's a Lenormand Oracle deck. So it's, it's got cards that weren't originally part of Lenormand decks, but it's the Lunar Nomad Oracle. I really, really like that one, and it kind of expands on the Lenormen deck just a little bit for people like me who don't know how to use it. <laughs> then we have the Thought, or Tot, or Tote, or Thoth, <laughs> or Toth, <laughs> uh, tarot deck, which was created by Aleister Crowley, you know, famed occultist and 20th century sex pervert, and he based... <laughs> He based his even further on his hermetic beliefs surrounding the god uh, thought in ancient Egyptian mythology, as well as um, even more Kabbalah and more numbers and more math. The symbolism in the cards is, is very unique, but technically these decks can be read just like Rider weight cards if you have a little bit of practice and a book, which Aleister Crowley also wrote. It's called The Book of Thought. Amazing. So personally, I am a Rider Waite fan forever. I love the symbolism. There's so much of it. There is so, so much of it. And I'm, I don't think it's a surprise that, that this deck uh, came to be incorporated with Carl Jung's theories of archetypes in psychology and astrology, because the symbols of the deck are timeless. The people on the deck are relatively timeless. The positions, the symbols, all of it are universal. People who don't even know what the tarot is can identify certain cards like the death card or the magician or the three of swords. These are symbols that just instantly speak to us. I love the original Rider Waite, but I don't actually use my copy of the Rider Waite for reading. I use it for learning. I have my copy so that I can learn to use the tarot. And I do look through it sometimes when I'm really trying to figure out a card, even if the deck I'm using is different. If it's kind of a descendant of the Rider Waite, I will grab my deck to just kind of look at some of the original symbolism. Um, this is really the best way to go if you're new to tarot, by the way. Uh, it may seem a little bit boring or a little bit yellow because the deck has a lot of yellow. Uh, a lot of yellow, big yellow backgrounds, but, um, almost every book that you will find on tarot reading and on the symbols in the tarot will be taken from the writer weight. So one of those books that was just released last year, I mean, there are a million books that will tell you how to read the writer weight, but one that was released last year that I have really, really loved is Madame Pamita's Magical Tarot. I love it. I love Madame Pamita. I love, <laughs> I loved her podcast, um, Magic and the Law of Attraction. And I love her, she has a YouTube channel because she also has a shop, uh, parlorofwonders.com. She sells great stuff. She does a series of YouTube videos called Who Do How To, and she shows you how to do different spells in a hoodoo style. Many of them are candle spells, which of course are my favorite, but some are also, you know, mojo bags and, and poppets. And I think she did teas and potions. I watch these all the time. I've seen, 
I've seen every single one like a hundred times now because I just find it very entertaining and calming. It's a little bit like, um, okay, it's a little bit like watching Martha Bakes, but for witches. For those who were never a Martha Stewart fan, like I wasn't until she went to jail, uh, <laughs> Martha Bakes was just her by herself in her kitchen baking shit. And it was a very chill show. Like it was almost, <laughs> it was almost meditative because Martha Stewart, even though everything came out Martha Stewart perfect, she seemed relatively normal and down to earth. And I knew when I watched it, no, nothing I would make would come out like Martha Stewart's. I'm not silly. But something about the close-ups on her hands, measuring out the ingredients, sometimes not doing it the way you're supposed to, and needing jokes and making, you know, kneading dough and making bad jokes about um, about pastries. <laughs> it's just very fun. And I feel kind of this way about Madame Pamita's videos, though I'm much more excited <laughs> to make a candle spell than I am to make anything that involves baking. It's just not my bag. I'd rather eat baked goods than make baked goods. So if you, <laughs> little tangent, I'm sorry. So if you want to check those out on YouTube, look for Madame Pamita. Um, they're fantastic. Start with any of them. I think my favorite is the Queen Nefertiti candle spell. Yeah. She also does one on the Rose of Jericho that I thought was really, really cool. So this book, Madame Pamita's Magical Tarot, um, this is a five crystal ball out of five book for sure. What I like most about it is that it had a bunch of different ways to interact with the symbols on each card. So she has a full write up, really easy to understand, explains things in ways that, you know, normal people will actually be able to absorb and then repeat and use, <laughs> which sometimes doesn't happen, of course. So very, very simple to understand. She has the suits divided and then she also has the court cards divided by each suit and she has the major arcana in the back of course she also has like a point form list keys to the treasure chest key symbols of what i'm looking at right now is the ace of swords so she gives you key little points like you know the olive branch represents peace reconciliation and wisdom then she tells you what the Ace of Swords signifies in a reading, like clear communication brings great results. The universe is giving you a yes. Cool. She also has journal questions for every card. So for this one, what subject do I need to view with impartial clarity? Mm. And then finally, she has an affirmation for every single card. And for the Ace of Swords, it's I open up to clarity and truth. So... I loved this layout because you get this well-written, um, you know, the full write-up for when you really do want to sit there and read it and really absorb everything from the book. But she also has key symbols so that if I'm just trying to do a reading in the moment, I can find exactly what I need. I loved it. She also explained a lot of the symbolism in here that I had never really given a whole lot of thought. I had never really get, given a whole lot of thought to some of these these symbols. Uh, especially some of the ones that are related to Hermetic Kabbalah, as I know now. So <laughs> she answered a question that I never really thought to ask anyone, but that I, I was curious about. So with the Ace of Swords, and these, this appears on many cards, but the Ace of Swords is, is a very good example. What are those little flames that are <laughs> like raining from the sky? Okay. For those who know what I'm talking about on tarot cards, they are little yellow. They look like little individual flames. She points this out. It's right here on page 23, right near the beginning. How fantastic. Those six little flamey symbols that are raining down around the sword are called yods and are points of divine energy. Yod is the first letter of the tetragrammatron. Tetragrammaton. I am sorry. The four letters that represents the unpronounceable name of the creator. In Hebrew mysticism, this letter symbolically represents a blessing. Hebrew letters, like runes, have numerical and symbolic values, as well as indicating sounds. There are three yods on each side of the sword in perfect balance. Like the scales of justice, this balance represents the fairness of impartial and intellectual judgment. That was great! 
<laughs> that was great. She even calls them, you know, little flamey symbols because that's that's exactly what I called them. So knowing now that those aren't flames, they aren't in any way related to fire, that definitely changes some of the things I see in some of these cards, like the Ace of Swords. Those little symbols, which a lot of people mistake for flames, actually have been the basis for a lot of people thinking the suit of swords is more associated with flames than it is with air. Knowing what those yods are makes it a little bit different. So that was really, really cool. Um, I learned a lot about the tarot deck just from reading this book, and I love using it to read. Like I, I love reading the book, but I love using it to read in the moment. I especially really love the, the, the journal questions. So if you pull a single card for a reading at the beginning of the day, you already have journal questions and an affirmation to kind of help you carry that energy through you all day. I love that. The only thing that you could say is missing about this book um, is anything about reading the cards in reverse. You know, if the card comes out upside down instead of right side up. But I don't really mind. Um, not everyone does that. For the people who do, when you're reading tarot, if a card presents in reverse, it's upside down, it has a different meaning than when it's right side up. You'll hear people say it means the opposite or that it's inherently negative, but that's that's not quite it either. I often think of a reversed card like, um, like this particular energy could cause a delay or in this area of your life, you might f come up against a roadblock. If this is a card about change, for example, and right side up, it's very serious change, but the card comes in reverse. I would see that as a sign that that change is really on hold for now. So you almost kind of get a little bit break. That's not inherently negative, right? So I like books that feature both interpretations so that if I'm reading and I have like a super positive card in a position where I'm supposed to be finding out the source of a problem or something like that, I can apply the context to myself and see it from this other perspective. And in that way, you don't really need to actually end up turning any of the cards. You can just be like, okay, well, this makes sense for here. But this is, you know, a more intermediate <laughs> level of reading. If you're trying to learn, start with your upright meanings, figure out all your symbolism, and then eventually you can learn this next level. So the lack of reversals in Madame Pemita's Magical Tarot did not keep it from getting uh, five crystal balls out of five, because I still think what you get out of the symbolism of each individual card is going to be a little bit different than what you might already know, even if you're someone who's been reading for a long time, like me. So I thought it would be fun um, to show off some of the reasons why this book is great. I thought it would be cool to pull a couple of cards and describe to you how those symbols present themselves in, in this copy of the book. So I've got my deck here, and I actually am using the, the Rider weight. <laughs> I actually am, because it lines up perfectly. So I'm going to pull two cards. Okay, well that worked out really well. I pulled out the moon from the major arcana and the three of cups from the minor. So let's see what, what Madame Pamita has to say about the moon. Now, in the first paragraph, she really describes the imagery of the card. And since you guys aren't here, I'm going to read that for you so you get a good picture. A pool of water lies in front of you with a path emerging from it, leading over hills between two towers and away into the mountains. A crayfish emerges from the water and begins to crawl up the path. To the left of the path, a dog raises his head to howl at the moon. To the right of the path, a wolf does the same. A mysterious moon that is simultaneously full, half, and crescent rains down golden beams of light and floating flames over the scene. 
fun, right? I hope you guys got a good idea. Um, of course, those floating flames, let's establish this right now, are yods. They are blessings raining down from the moon. So in this card, what we have in, in terms of symbols, we have the crayfish or a lobster, depending on your deck, which represents deep desires because they are a creature who lives very deep into the sea. We have the dog, which is a lot like the wolf, but it's more about pleasing people specifically. Dogs are very into pe pleasing their people friends. The moon is mysterious and intuitive and undefined. And because it's simultaneously in all these phases, that undefined element really is there. You have these mountains, which means having the tools to meet the challenges ahead because your path, your life journey, easily winds right through them. The pool of water is your intuition. It's a, it's a well of spirituality. You have the, the rays acting as the yods here, <laughs> um, which are raining light down, reflecting light. The two towers are gateways uh, in initiation and transformation. So this card in a reading, what does she say here? In a reading, the moon signifies being initiated into a new state of beating, finding a middle path between always pleasing others and complete selfishness. Oh, I did forget the wolf on the other side of our dog represents selfishness because it's less of a people pleasing animal, of course. So finding a middle path between always pleasing others and complete selfishness, receiving blessings for being self-guided, things being undefined or vague, and trusting deep intuition to guide you. And those are, those really are a lot of the meanings of the moon. It can also represent other things uh, included in intuition, like dreams. I really like the affirmation for the moon that she has in here, which is I balance pleasing myself and pleasing others. I think that's a really strong affirmation to carry with you throughout the, do the day and to have it in such a, like a beautiful card. The moon is one of the faves, right? <laughs> Everybody loves the moon. There's the moon, the star and the sun, but the moon is the one that's, that really captures people's imaginations because that's what the moon does. It captures our imagination. She says, when the moon shows up, it's often an indicator of undefined energy. You won't find structure, rules, regimentation, or discipline surrounding this card. You have to tap in intuitively, intuitively to whether this lack of definition is a good thing or a bit of a challenge. For those who thrive in structured environments, the undefined nature of the moon may feel too vague. But for those who thrive in more open-minded worlds, the vagueness of the moon is a place of freedom. Really neat. So I, lo I loved her interpretation of the moon. And of course, it lasts a few pages and you will just have to get a copy of the book yourself to see everything she says. Let's look at our next card, the Three of Cups, which is actually, this is one of my favorites. It's one of the first cards I ever really, I, I ever really had like a real affinity for. I, I just really like this card. So uh, here's our description. You're invited to an outdoor gathering where three lovely ladies are dancing together and toasting each other with golden goblets raised. They sway to the music amid the abundant fruits at their feet and wear bountiful flower crowns on their heads. I always associate this card, I call it in my head, I call it the coven card. I associate it with finding your, you know, your group of people where you can be yourself, where you can share everything and you can kind of celebrate things like that. So some of the symbols we see in the Three of Cups, we have the dancing, which symbolizes lightheartedness, play, fun, and grace. We have the flower crowns, which uh, means that our minds are on abundance and happiness. We have the fruit at their feet, which again is abundance, growth, success, uh, raises, and promotions if you get this in a spot that indicates or if you ask about uh, your finances. Three Cups which means hearts connecting in love and friendship, celebration and drinking. And then we have the three women, friendship, social activity, cooperation, camaraderie and equality. And that really is what I associate this card with. Like I said, I, I often think of it as like the coven card, finding your, your coven, your, your, your squad, you know, your, your bitches. So, <laughs> 
So what this signifies in a reading is friendship and warm closeness, sharing joy with others, highlight on social activity, celebrating success, time to relax, have fun, and play. And again, the affirmation for this card was lovely. It's, I have so much to celebrate in my life. And when I see this card, that is that really is exactly how I feel. I have so much to celebrate. I'm so happy for, you know, my friends and the things that I do have and the time that I get to spend doing the things that I love with the people that I don't hate. <laughs> Over the last three years, I've shared a lot about my ongoing journey to better mental health, and I get messages all the time from listeners who are also struggling and looking for someone to talk to. Unfortunately, it can be very difficult to find therapy that is fully accessible, financially or otherwise. That's where BetterHelp comes in. BetterHelp is an online service that can connect you with real licensed counselors who can be available on your schedule and right where you are. With four different ways to communicate and a wide range of specialties, there's a good chance you can find someone perfect for you, all without leaving home. Everything is confidential, and if you ever feel like your counselor isn't the right fit for you, you can switch right away. Not only is the service really affordable compared to in-person therapy, they also offer financial aid for those who need it. It's okay to need help. You deserve to get better, and you can start that journey at betterhelp.com slash fatfeministwitch and save 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash fatfeministwitch. Spooky Things Magazine is a brand new curated monthly art zine containing work from well-known and emerging artists from all over. The subject matter is all in spooky fun and perfect for any witchy art lover. Head to SpookyThingsZine.com and get yourself a copy of the brand new, number one, first edition of Spooky Things, which is, of course, Halloween themed. You can also get a copy that comes with extra stickers, limited edition buttons, and gifts from the creator of the zine, also known as Peaceful Pagan Person on Instagram. Peaceful Pagan Person also has an incredible Etsy shop where you can get tarot readings, witch bottles and balls resin artwork that has real flowers and herbs worked right in as well as a whole bunch of other really really fun spooky stuff for your home and your practice every day is halloween and spooky things magazine so head to spookythingszine.com and get yourself a copy today Something else I liked about Madame Pamita's book is that it really fits in with both the magical and psychological work that can be done with the tarot. So because tarot cards elicit these, these super strong responses and make us ask all of these questions, they're a great tool for exploring more about yourself and exactly what it is you think and feel in any sort of situation. I often use cards as a way to organize my thoughts or divide a problem into multiple parts so that I can, you know, <laughs> navigate a solution and sometimes just to get something out. I always combine tarot reading with journaling, though I haven't really thought of journaling with the cards outside of the context of what it means in my spread. But there really is just so much symbolism to meditate on on their own in each card. So I really like that in the book. That's not to say that I don't find any magic <laughs> in using the cards, because I do. I often feel as though the cards have a mind of their own, and that the advice coming through is not coming from me, but from coming outside somewhere. I'll have particular cards pop up in every reading for like a period of time, and it drives me bonkers, because I'm obviously just not getting the damn message, so give it to me in a different way, whoever you are. <laughs> But uh, when, when I'm reading the tarot cards, right, my intuition kicks in and it responds to the messages laid out uh, and I pick up on the details. Sometimes I get it right and sometimes I don't. But what if you're reading with cards where there is none of those details that don't have these beautiful pictures showing you the meaning of every card? Well, that's what it's like reading with tarot cards, oh, with uh, playing cards. <laughs> tarot reading with a deck of regular playing cards may not be the most popular method of divination anymore, but remember that this is where that started. 
And because it's it's not quite as popular, it kind of makes it just a little bit more interesting. I've recently started teaching myself this, uh, you know, slightly older method of card divination, and I never really realized quite how little I have managed to memorize about the cards and how much I rely on the images and what they elicit in my intuition, you know, what they bring up. You don't really get the, the playing cards, right? So in Fortune Telling with Playing Cards, the late Jonathan D. explains exactly how to read with the smaller deck and what the cards in their suits all mean. And it's a pretty short book. This one was also released by Wiser, although it was first published, I think, in 2009. So it's been re-released recently. Reading with playing cards is like reading with only the minor arcana of your tarot. So you have your four suits with elemental associations, meanings, and even a few court cards. Hearts are aligned with cups and the element of water, emotions, and intuition. Diamonds are aligned with pentacles or coins, the earth element, and resources and business. These red suits are considered more positive. So a lot of hearts is usually a good thing unless it's all hearts and then it's just a little bit too much. <laughs> the black suits, the spades, and the clubs indicate that there could be trouble coming or challenges that you have to overcome. Clubs are aligned with wands, the element of fire, and your friendships and your influences on and from other people. And then the spades are our swords. They are aligned with air and they represent things like affairs, arguments, anxiety, disappointment, and also a little bit about communication. This is this is a difficult method to learn, but there is definitely something really, really special about the, the vibe of reading with playing cards. I actually posted a small reading using my very basic playing cards um, on Instagram this morning if you want to see a little bit about the interpretations and what it looks like. So this book by Jonathan D was a really great primer on reading with the playing cards, but it really was just a primer. He talked about reversals. But those interpretations were very short, like only a few keywords, like one or two words. In the court cards, their entire interpretation um, hinged on them being other people. And that's not really the way that I read court cards. So I had to use other books and, you know, regular tarot meanings to kind of make up my own guide for those based on their suit and their, you know, their general demeanor on the card. Because <laughs> you, you get a good look at these jokers on here, right? Not Joker specifically, bad turn of phrase there, the uh, Jacks, Kings, and Queens. Um, but it was, it's still easy to come up with that as long as you have a guide on tarot. So I used a combination of fortune telling with playing cards and Madame Pamita's book when I was reading these. Um, and I really enjoy it. It's something I'd rather get a more fancy card for. I just bought mine very cheap at the dollar store because it says to begin with a new deck. And I agree with that. Even though there aren't these full color, you know, striking images, seeing these cards does really make you feel a certain way. Just like tarot, these are symbols that have been around forever and that have meanings to people all over the world. And sometimes they're very different and sometimes they're very universal. I like that the Ace of Spades means endings, death, challenges, and ruthlessness. <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. You know, the Ace of Spades is considered kind of a, a scary or a bad luck card. So rather than being the Ace of Swords with the odds raining down that represent blessings, the Ace of Spades shows that this is the time to ditch the past and make a fresh start to solve existing problems and resolve old enmities. Only when this uncomfortable process has been completed can the questioner move on to a new phase of life. Illusion is banished by the appearance of the Ace of Spades, and cozy, comforting dreams are swept away by the harsh wind of pitiless reality that will cut like a blade through the questioner's most cherished fantasies. <laughs> ah, I really love that. The reverse card meaning uh, indicates similar winds of change, but within the questioner's circle, not the questioner themselves. So that's a little helpful, but some of them are, weren't even that helpful. So, <laughs> so if you are interested in getting started and learning exactly how it works and on having a little guide that you can use while you are learning to read, 
I do recommend Fortune Telling with Playing Cards by Jonathan D. But remember that if you do want to do the reversals, you might need something a little bit more substantial. So in my lifetime, or at least in the last 10 to 15 years, tarot reading, whether you're reading or getting readings, has drastically changed. (laughs) It's changed quite a few times. Even though reading tarot has been popular for a couple centuries now, it was still not really considered to be real <laughs> and was often used in, you know, scams and things like that. In the 90s, you had Miss Cleo and her Psychic Friends Network. And I'm actually seeing more and more online um, online websites where you can contact a bunch of different psychics. Now, as far as I could tell, they're more legit because that's something that matters now. But it wasn't always. So getting tarot readings has changed a lot. There's generally a little bit more trust with the person who's reading. You can ask them questions about their psychic abilities and you should be able to get answers. There's also this possibility of getting readings or giving readings when you are very, very far from the other person. And people ask me about this all the time. I see a lot of people online say, I don't understand how distance readings work. You know, how can you do a reading for someone who lives on the opposite side of the country from you or maybe the opposite side of the planet? I need to be there. I need to sense their energy. I need, I need, I need whatever, you know. And that's fine. I mean, everybody needs something different to, you know, to activate or to kind of work with their own psychic abilities. But I happen to be someone who really struggles to read for another person in person when they're sitting right in front of me. And I believe that's just because of my my social anxiety, right? But it might not be. <laughs> I just, that's my theory. Um, so in a distance reading, my distance readings are much more accurate and coherent than any in-person reading I've ever given. And I know this because I ask and, <laughs> and I get much different reviews on the online readings. So I I am a good distance reader, and that's why I wanted to mention this. A few people ask. So how a distance reading works, it's different for everybody. But when I am selling tarot readings online, when someone orders a reading from me, they'll provide me with their name. Uh, I tell them they can give me their birth date if they want to. I like to know a little bit about where they're from. It can be as simple as, I live in the United States. Just because... um, Well, the messages you give, all of these messages have to be kind of framed through the world that person lives in. And cultures vary so widely that you want to make sure that you are giving them the message in a way that actually makes sense for them, that they can apply to their lives. So I'll ask a few basic questions like that. And I will actually really focus in on that. And I will start to get things before I even begin touching the cards. It's only after I feel like my intuition has given me enough information to know a little bit about this person um, that I really get into it. Now, I ask them some questions. If they have a specific question they want me to answer, I might ask a little bit of background and they'll describe it to me, of course. But not everybody has a question. Some people just want to get a general reading. You know, what's, what's up with my life? Where am I? What's coming up in the future? So even though I get very little information, my my intuitive abilities kind of start to fill in the rest. And what that does is provide context for the cards that I lay down. And, you know, I've never done a distance reading and had someone say, none of that is me. <laughs> this is so outrageous. Um, not everyone's been perfect, right? But I've never had someone say, wow, it doesn't feel like you are in tune with who I am at all. Never. Because this is something I'm very confident about. And it's because that's the kind of psychic ability I possess. I am uh, an intuitive reader. And a lot of times intuition is just knowing. You just know things. It comes from this particular place that I couldn't quite describe. But it's all of a sudden this deep knowing this is the truth. And that's how it is. And that provides context for all the cards that I pull. For other people, they need the person that they're reading for to touch the cards, to imbue them with their energy that way. They need to be able to look at the person or hear their voice or connect with their physical or metaphysical energy in a more up-close and personal way. 
I find that super uncomfortable. <laughs> so it doesn't actually help me. It, um, I get too into watching their facial expressions every time I say something, and it's, it's not good. That's not a good way to give a reading. <laughs> you can't concentrate. So if you are wondering if distance readings are legitimate, <laughs> if this is actually real, if this is actually possible, yes, it absolutely is. And some people really are better at distance readings than they are up close and personal. Really cool. So getting a distance reading is no longer like calling the Psychic Friends Network. <laughs> um, you could buy those readings from people you know, from people on shops like Etsy, or from podcasters like me. So if you guys are interested in getting some long distance readings, I have recently decided to open up a shop on Store Envy so that I can do tarot and oracle readings. And you can find that at the thefatfeministwitch.storeenvy.com, which is S-T-O-R-E-N-V-Y, thefeministwitch.storeenvy.com. I'll obviously put the link in the description. And there you guys will see that I have full readings up for sale, as well as some three card readings so that you can just dip your toe in if you're interested. How this would work is that you would order a reading from me. You would give me that little bit of information. I would do your reading. You could ask me a question. I use a combination of some of the other methods of divination. So along with my tarot cards, I'll often include oracle cards to get some of that more um, practical, everyday influence, as well as the spiritual one. If I feel like I need it or I need to communicate with any sort of spirits or beings, I usually use a pendulum for that because I find that that is, man, pendulums are spooky. <laughs> So I'll use a pendulum if I, I feel like I need to ask anybody else for advice. And you'll get all of that on a PDF with a little audio clip of me explaining some of the more interesting or pressing parts of your reading. And you can take that forward and keep all of that so that later you can come back and see how things have progressed. So again, if you guys are interested, the thefatfeministwitch.storeenvy.com. I will be putting a link everywhere. I'm pretty excited about this. I miss tarot reading for others. I do. I read tarot for myself every single day. Um, I do it in the morning. I do a reading that's, you know, four or five cards at nighttime before bed. I have my before bed spread that is about six cards long. And I take that time to not only, um, you know, do my reading with my cards, but also write down some of the things that happened today or some of the things that I'm going through and how they relate. So I'm pretty excited to kind of, you know, peek around in someone else's life using my tarot cards versus just my own. And I'm very excited to be getting back into this witchy, this witchy stuff right as uh, Halloween is coming up. I'm pretty excited about that, obviously. So three card readings of either tarot or oracle cards at $10. You can get a full reading for $40. And I will be having a special Halloween specific tarot reading, which will be $31.10 because I'm silly. And <laughs> that will be opening up starting this weekend. So I hope you guys check it out. Come get a reading and, you know, obviously tell me if it's any good after. <laughs> That was everything that I had for you witches today. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Fat Feminist Witch podcast today. If you want to find out more about me, you can do that at thefatfeministwitch.com. You can also find me across social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and even Pinterest. Just look up the Fat Feminist Witch. Most of the time, that'll be me. <laughs> if you want to support the show, you can do so by going to my website and clicking the button that says buy me a coffee to make a short little one-time donation. Or if you want to, you can join the private monthly membership group for $10 by going to patreon.com slash the fat feminist witch. In this group, we do live meetups, we read books together, we, you know, get together for holidays and full moons and all sorts of really fun extras here for the show. Of course, you can now also go to the fat feminist witch and buy a reading. The next episode of the Fat Feminist Witch podcast will be on October 24th, and we will be talking about omens, events and signs from the universe that tell us if good or bad is coming our way. 
I hope you all have a very fabulous weekend, especially you other Canadians who are celebrating Thanksgiving this weekend and the full moon on October 13th. Happy Thanksgiving, other Canadians. For the rest of you, I hope you also have a very good weekend. (laughs) Thank you so much for tuning in today. And I will talk to you guys in two weeks when we will discuss omens.